Good morning everyone, it's Calvin here and today we're going to talk about a bit of a touchy subject and a lot of people get very emotional about it but it's inbreeding or line breeding. One of the options I looked at before getting my Wiltshire flock was the black nose valet and I'm pretty sure I'm saying that correct though I do have people who say it as a valet, valet. I'm going to stick with Valet because, and I'm quite prepared to be corrected. Right, but I, ch I considered them as an option for a small block, put in some good breeding, there could be some okay returns from it. And I still watch the odd auction and I still watch the odd sales and see what's happening in, in that arena. What, ca what I saw recently on a Facebook post was this fella. Yeah, and this fella, if you have a look at the breeding of him, it turns out that this fella's dad was also his granddad. And the men that re brings in the ethics of inbreeding or line breeding. And it's something that, from a small block holding, ramifications or the possible outcomes of that should be considered. And it's a massive topic, way bigger than we can handle in this amount of time. Morning, Minty. Hey, buddy. How you going? So we'll just introduce Minty while I'm out here doing my morning walk. And we can see here, that is one of my chickens. So there is kind of a success story of line breeding. And it will contain some inbreeding. That is a highline chicken. Over there, we actually have uh, the grey ones are my barred rocks. The white one is a, a highline barred rock, so it was had a highline mum and a barred rock dad. And Duncan, Duncan's an old man. Where is he? Where's Duncan? And there is my rooster, Duncan. So I'm very careful about him crossing any of his daughters. Though it's very, very common in chicken breeding. Now for those of you that said, hey this guy's a complete idiot, because that is not a line bred chicken. You are correct, that is not a line bred chicken, that is a hybrid. Yes, that is a hybrid. But the parent stock are line bred to give a very consistent, very genetically close animal. And then they are crossed to get the benefits of that, of that hybrid vigour to produce an extremely consistent animal, but they are designed, the modern shaver or highline is designed as a one-use chicken. They're not designed to be bred further than that. Use them, get their production, and then they leave the system, an all-in, all-out general system. And that is how that animal is designed. And if you, if you actually take the time to look at the specs on that chicken, the egg laying is amazing, but their longevity is not actually very amazing on their specs. They have spec sheets, just like a car. They have a spec sheet on a high line chicken or a shaver chicken. One of the ways I solve uh, inbreeding in my chickens is to give excess chicks away to my friends. And with the price of eggs these days, I have no shortage of people who would like chickens. And even if it means sometimes that there's chickens under my dining table with a heat lamp hang, hanging above them uh, when a hatch hasn't gone quite gone to plan or there is too many to go under a hen. Another advantage of the, the highline breed is that they pretty much never go clucky which of course contributes to their production worth but their breeding worth would be totally crap. <laughs> And, and the reason these are the white one is the, the first outcross from that uh, hybrid high line, you get a massive variance because there's a whole lot of other characteristics in the background that then get expressed. Right, back to the sheep. And for those of you that get a bit emotional about this stuff, remember that these are sheep, these aren't humans, so we're not crossing humans it's a little bit different 
and their ethics is a little bit different. Now some people think that, will say that if line breeding, if it works it's line breeding, if it doesn't work it's inbreeding. And there are benefits to using these breeding techniques. But you need to have a little bit of understanding of genetics and how it works. Now how am I qualified to talk about this? I'm not, none. Uh, but before I was born my parents were uh, doing performance recording on our pig herd and then we were breeding Drysdale sheep and then we went on to dairy goats and my mum spent her lifetime breeding dairy goats. And on a another bit of a controversial note, uh, some of mum's goats have just been collected because they are going on a plane and getting live exported, exported over to Korea. And even before she passed she was still tinkering with the dairy goats and I would watch my mum take her little pen and go on a little bit of paper and she'd go white paper not with a computer and cull a complete line of goats because it didn't work and I think that's one of the points that if you are going to engage in line breeding then you need to be prepared to do that there is my faithful friend now she's not, not inbred or line bred. Coming from some pig dogs, there are some pig dogs that are, uh, certainly have some, some line breeding within them and has achieved some good results. But there's also been some disasters with dogs. Of course, your Alsatian with the hip problems, the longevity problems, pugs with their breeding problems. And that, there really can be some disasters with uh, that breeding style if you don't understand it or you're not prepared to cull hard when you get it wrong right, We're going to compare this fella here. So that is roast And out of my main line of sheep, which is descended from from granny This is granny's 2023 20, male lamb She had twins uh, Father was Morty. He was half Aussie white. So this guy is quarter Aussie white and you can see that starting to express through in the, the frame and the constitution of that animal. He's extremely quiet. Uh, the shed isn't quite as good as I'd like. But, but that is coming through. There's the, the Aussie white styling. Here his, his sister. That's Crystal. So we can see we've got some black nose coming through. We've got a better shed. We've got a finer body. What's up with your eye, miss? You've got a bit of a sore eye. That dust is starting to get us out in the dryness. And we're going to put the two together. There we go. So that fella, that fella, and this one, brother and sister. Now people will say, hey, they're the same genes. But actually, how closely related are they? We, we can see different genes being expressed. We've got a black nose. We've got a bit more chunky in there. They are different animals. And that's because genetically, if we do some maths on it, if we sat down and did some maths, Oh, sorry, Poppy. These two are about 50% related. And that's why we, um, I don't look like my brother and I don't look like my sister. And different genes are expressed. And nature is very, very good at doing that. So they, even with the same parents, nature does give some genetic variation. <laughs> I think it's time for a drench, eh? <laughs> Ugh. Right, these guys have actually only been drenched once in November and they're just starting to come across contaminated pasture so it's probably time to chuck a drench down them. So in here, all of my lambs are related. Oh, actually, that is incorrect. That one and that one, those two, their dad was Buff. There were a couple of older ewes that were running with Buff and produced those two, so they are not related. And then I've got two that are Minty's daughters, which are over here. That one there with the funny ears. And the second one in with the, not, not totally well shed, but a big bum. That is one of Minty's daughters, that one there. And... Miss Funny Ears, that one. Otherwise, the rest of these lambs are related. 
Of course, I got my my cheapy two dudes over there. They are those those four back there. They kind of hang out together. Our two dudes. Hey, Crystal. Hey, Miss. Yeah. Good girl. So the concept of line breeding is to use genetically similar animals to enhance the traits, the positive traits. And it will be bringing in family members into that breeding program. It's also used a lot with thoroughbreds. My neighbor does thoroughbreds. But the advantage with a thoroughbred is the horses live much longer. So you can be using a great great granddad or, a, or an uncle much more removed to bring that back into that line. And that gives greater genetic variance. If you want to check up on my numbers of my correlation of relationship, I think that's what you call it, for crystal and roast, go ahead. You will find that they are 50%. What it means in real terms is that on a, across a bell curve, and we, we talk about bell curves a lot with breeding, is that the average of animals, if we took say like 100 animals, the average of animals in a population, the average would be 50% in sharing the drink, in their genes. What it also means is at the far end of that bell curve, there's some that are still very, very distant genetically. And at the other end, there are some that are very close genetically. And so this is where the expression of different traits come out. If you have a very strong trait that you're trying to breed for, then it will be expressed in some of those animals by line breeding. At the same time, it can highlight some of those negative traits, and that can be a problem. So what nature does is it takes the genes from the mum and the dad, and it like puts them in a food processor, and it doesn't just break them in half, it splits them up into all the little pieces, and then distributes them to the offspring. And that's why there is genetic variation within the direct offspring. And that's why you can bring in, in a line breeding program, you can bring in the likes of an uncle or a great uncle and have a low amount of genetic resemblance, though there is still some. So understanding that helps a lot when it comes to making choices. Now for me, for me, I am trying to avoid it. I don't have enough knowledge and history of my animals, and history helps, and I'm not able to guarantee the traits that will be expressed by line breeding. So for my small population, I believe I can get greater genetic improvement by outsourcing or outbreeding with my rams or my sires. It doesn't matter what, what animal it is. The principles are the same. My goal this year is to actually use Minty across my ewes at the end of the season. I'm gonna run my big Aussie white crossbred ram because he does produce the lambs that I'm wanting. And you'll see that some of them didn't shed. What that means is I'm gonna have to have that hard decision what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this year's lambs as they're, when they're older, when they're hoggets. And I will choose the bottom end culls, which will not be sold to anyone. And then my excesses will be sold. And I won't sell my culls because I don't want them to go on and become breeding animals. If they've got traits that I wouldn't want to breed from or if I wouldn't want to breed from those animals myself and so this becomes the issue when you have a small population of very very valuable animals per individual that often people aren't prepared to cull heavily and that becomes an issue and the disclosure of it the non-disclosure of it back to the valet what I just said applies. I don't believe the population in New Zealand supports line breeding at this point in time. Though I don't have the history of those animals, I don't have the history of 
the, the line, the heritage, and the traits, and the desires of those breeders. What I do have a problem with, with the Valet in New Zealand, is the attempts to hide it. Okay, that is not okay. I watch, as I said, I've been watching what's going there because I was interested, because it was a consideration for my own animals. The attempts and the discussions with breeders as sellers and buyers needs to be up front. And I'm very big on that, with, especially with the ram breeders, of having that relationship, building that relationship, and choosing the right animals. And I've seen it on all levels. Lifestyle hobbyists, right through to buying some of the best rams in New Zealand. That that relationship, that discussion needs to be open and honest. And that's really important. And that is where I stand with this topic. Now at the end of the day as well, what my neighbours do with their breeding program is actually none of my business. Well in my case it actually is because I've supplied both of them with rams. But if they came to me, and if they have got some different ideas, and hey I'm, I'm part of some groups and with some breeders, and we have different ideas and we can share those ideas openly and that of our thoughts and we still get on even if we have different opinions on those but we are willing to share it so if someone is hiding their breeding program um, then I have a problem with it if they're not open if they can't openly state why they're doing what they're doing then I have a problem with it and also if a group of people have gotten together and formed a society for breeding pedigree animals and then they have they've committed to a, a code of conduct and that code of conduct includes for things like for the betterment of, of the breed uh, there's a breed standard which those animals are being bred to then I think there is a, a commitment or an obligation between the people of that contract, of that code of conduct, of that society, to actually disclose things and work together. And if they are trying to hide things, then I see a problem. I'm not expecting anyone from the New Zealand Black Nose Valet Sheep Society to come, and come forward because talking to me would be a breach of the code of conduct which they've agreed to, and I'm okay with that. Um, and I do understand. But think of it this way. If my neighbours came to me, and my neighbours have both got rams, and asked me for an unrelated ram and some ewes, and I supplied that, I'm not a ram breeder, just a note, I'm not a ram breeder. But if I supplied that to them, and then they went back, and if there was a system like grassroots for the valet breeders, and they plugged those animals in and found that there was a very close relationship of those animals and I'd said they were unrelated well again there is a problem isn't there oh, that's a hypothetical situation of course now I've seen this with the the dairy goats with the pedigree breeders there and I would see animals even when I was like a real young fella and I could spot them like as an early teenager I could spot problems with animals that were pedigrees and kept because of their pedigree when they should have been culled and they had features of those animals and there was constitutional problems with those animals and if you've got a breed standard you should be sticking to that breed standard regardless of whether they're line bred and hey if you've line bred a good constitutional animal what's the problem and if you if you if you out outbreed an animal with poor constitution then it should be culled no no different to a line bred one the animal should be kept on them both of their merits their, their, their physical merits and their genetic backgrounds and there's a balance in that we can compare this of course to nature as well and there are populations of animals that have been very confined that have become very genetically close and 
the and nature will cull very heavily for animals that don't survive in a system. They will nature will select the fittest animal for that system. It, it doesn't care about your profit. It doesn't care about the things that man, humans, may want in an animal. Nature has a different set of rules. If you're going to do it, also, make sure you have enough knowledge. So I believe a lot of the time it's best left to those research guys or their ram breeders that know exactly what they're doing and what traits they are trying to achieve. For the average bunny like me, not even worth attempting. And in fact, I try to avoid it. Tell me your thoughts. And it's not an attempt to knock people, it's a time, an attempt to, to invoke discussion and that's what we need within many industries. We need to talk, we need to understand and build relationships. That's really important. I'm going to continue checking my girls and I'll show you something that's really interesting in my ones. Right, I'm actually out checking my girls. Okay, so we, we had uh, Minty at the beginning, that's Minty's mum. Maudi is down here, there he, he's, he's all harnessed up. So that's Minty's mum, Granny. See up there, that, the top one's half sister. The one below that is Minty's daughter from uh, 2022. This one here, half sister. This one over here, Minty's full sister. It only leaves one more. Poppy, come in. How's your rattle? That little one there. Lambda's a hoggit, had twins. She's trying to be my most efficient ewe. She's trying to compete with this old girl here. There's a challenge. But as you can see why I really like Minty's line is they're all those early ones. They've already got marks on them showing that they're either in lamb or about to cycle because they've got those early teasing marks that the rams leave where they're just trying their luck. What have you got blue marks on your head for? Oh, you've been rubbing on something too. So that's the last of Minty's family. Funny enough, because Miss Molly is so little, she's incredibly efficient because she only has to rear a nice big single and it's well up near her, her body weight. You've definitely got some marks on your haven't fatty. Hey miss. Right. If you've enjoyed this video, if you've got this far, push the like button, subscribe, maybe have a comment. If I've done something wrong, tell me that I've done something wrong. And subscribe. Because that'll help me build some more views and make more videos and help more people out. Talk to you later.